Volume 3, Chapter 2, Cardiology. Alright, so we're going to review a little bit over A and B. We'll review a little bit of the, the gross anatomy. We're going to talk a lot more about the coronary vasculature. We haven't really talked, George talked about it a little bit the other day, but we've never really lectured on it yet. So it's really not hard. I promise you. Not bad. We'll, hopefully we'll get into a little bit of EKG today. Alright, so the sources <laughs> the, the sources <laughs> Damn it. Oh, Hang on, I got it. Got it. <laughs> oh, okay, so that's running. Sweet. Um Alright. Sources if you want to look them up. Human A and P textbook, A condition, paramedic practice today, and paramedic care. So we're talking about cardiovascular, which is the heart and the vessels, anatomy, uh, cardiac physiology. So we will talk a little bit about systole, diastole again. Um, I know George talked primarily about diastole, so I don't want you guys to be like, holy cow, everything he said was what the <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. You hear that? Stand by. Stand by. All right. <laughs> All right, so George talked a lot about diastole primarily. Um, it's incredibly important, and we'll talk about it a little more. So, again, we probably won't get into it today, but hopefully we'll at least get to the basics of EKG, just sinus rhythms. Mm -hmm. So, to discuss the heart, we'll talk about the location, the size, and everything. Um, and you saw that the other day. Pig hearts are the closest, closest animal to human hearts that we know of. So mm -hmm. as far as anatomically shaped, size, function, um, the type of tissue, and actually how cardiovascular muscle looks in the human. Um, but it is posterior to the sternum. That's why we do chest compressions on the sternum. Uh, approximately two thirds of the heart's mass is left of midline. So that's a little gross exaggeration of whenever you were a kid, all the cartoons said your heart was over here, right? It's pretty extreme. It's truly, it's mostly Substernal, but two thirds left of the midline. Now, this is important whenever we get into cardiovascular physiology. So, this is anatomy. We're talking about physiology for a second. The apex of the heart is the point. So, traditionally, you think of a base as the bottom, right? Well, yesterday you were thinking a base as the opposite of acid. But right now, we're talking about the base of the heart being the, the broadest part of the heart. So when you think base, think broad. Apex, think the point. Okay? So the base is the broad part. The apex is the point. Everybody okay with that? Apex point. Yeah. Apex point. <laughs> is the apex point. Alright. So if we were to do a cross section of the heart, or true, well, not really a cross section, but if we were to cut the heart in half, this is what we would see. I know that the, the actual, the words back there are probably very blurry. I have another slide coming up to where it clears them up a little bit. But if we were looking at the outermost going to the innermost, we have on the heart, we have the pericardial, the, we have the fibrous pericardium or the pericardial sac. And like we said at the beginning of the year, that's kind of like if you take the heart and you drop it in and like a canvas potato sack, right? Do you guys remember that? And then we actually have the epicardium. We have the visceral epicardium, which is, if it's visceral, it actually touches the organ, right? Think visceral, think meat. Parietal is the outermost. So there's a space between the parietal pericardium and the, the visceral pericardium. Then you have, you have the middle, you have the myocardium. Myocardium, middle, muscle. Myo, muscle, right? And it's also the middle. So all the M's. All the M's. Okay, that is where the actual contraction happens. And then on the inside, we have the endo, bless you, you, cardium. You. We have an endocardium. It's not out, though. It's endo, right? It's on the inside. It is the smooth layer that is bathed by the blood. This is the endocardium in here. Endocardium, myocardium, epicardium, and then the fibrous pericardium. <laughs> this is the slide I was talking about. So again, if you were to take a little chunk of the actual ventricle, 
and pull it out here. Epicardium is that really, that the layer on top, that is the visceral pericardium. That's the same thing. The epicardium and the visceral pericardium are the same exact thing. All right? So when you think visceral, what do you think? Meat. 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 You think venison. You think meat. So that is the layer that's touching the heart. It's touching the organ. It's touching the meat. All right? Middle, myocardium or muscle, and then endocardium's on the inside. So um, we know that cardiac cells or myocardial cells are different because they have the ability to, to conduct their own electrical impulse or they are automatistic, right? Um, so the, the actual conduction cycle or the membrane potential of cardiac muscle is very similar to that of smooth muscle. However, we have we have those leaky sodium channels that allow us to create our own electricity, right? Remember in the conductive myocytes, <clears throat> the tissue never really has a rest period, right? As soon as it drops below 40, those conductive myocytes open up the sodium channels and allow for that to come in, and then calcium comes in and causes the, the conduction. So we'll talk about that a little more. We'll refresh our minds on that. So when we talk about the endocardium, again, it's the innermost layer. It's bathed in blood, so it's very slick. It's very, it's it's meant to be lubricated. All right. So the pericardium, again, it is the protective sac surrounding the heart. So like I've said already, you have the parietal pericardium, which is the outermost parietal. You're thinking of a potato sack. Parietal pericardium is the outermost fibrous layer. That layer does not stretch well at all. So if you think about pericardial tamponade, or you think about myocarditis, or pericarditis rather, then you, you realize that that sack does not stretch well acutely. Therefore, that's why a pericardial tamponade, if that area is filling up with blood, you're not going to be able to expand to contract. Does that make sense? So that is the fibrous outermost layer. On your way in, you have the visceral. Visceral, you think meat. That's the one that actually touches the organ. All right. So in the pericardial cavity, the cavity that's between the pericardial sac and the visceral pericardium or the epicardium. So there's a small little gap, right? So you have a, a, la a gap that allows about 25 milliliters of fluid. So the reason that we do that, or the reason that we're designed that way is because it reduces friction. It prevents any type of, of abrasion or inflammatory processes, okay? However, if we have trauma to that area, if we have trauma to the heart that causes bleeding in that area, and we get 100 cc's in there, is, so if it's used to 25 milliliters of fluid, but now all of a sudden we have 100, is that gonna prevent how much it can expand? Yeah. So that is where the whole process behind a pericardial tamponade happens. So if you, if you put fluid in here against the myocardium where there's not supposed to be any, these walls can't expand. So where does the blood back up? Well, it backs up into the atria, and then it back, backs up into the vena cava, and then eventually, what are you going to be able to see? JVD. JVD. Does that make sense? So pericarditis is the same way. Pericarditis, it's an in, it is inflammation. Itis. You got that itis. You have the itis of the pericardium. <laughs> Dr. Kemp was just, he'd just be rolling his eyes and laughing. What y'all think about that, by the way? Good. He's good. He, need, he needs to make an audio book because I'd just be like, <laughs> I, I would, very soothing voice. Um, I told him that and I said not in a gay way doc but you have a smooth voice man and he's just like I know I appreciate that alright but um, so if we're looking at the chambers of the heart we have four chambers we have four primary chambers and we'll talk about appendages separately but primarily we have four chambers the two superior most are the atria so the two at the top right Two at the bottom are ventricles. Which ones are the primary ones of contraction? Ventricles. ventricles, right? The atria are primarily composed of conductive myocytes, but they do have a little bit of kick. 
So now the atria will receive incoming blood. They receive it either deoxygenated blood from the system or they receive oxygenated blood from the lungs. And then they push them. They have a little bit of kick down into the ventricles, right? The primary, about two-thirds of ventricular filling is done upon diastole. So it's done passively, right? So you have the passive filling of the atria. Those, those, those valves open, and it's passive. They're stretching, 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 filling with blood. And then the atria will contract a little bit. They'll just contract enough to send the rest, I don't, I don't know. They'll send the rest of the blood into the ventricles in order to expand enough to cause a contraction. All right. So the blood flow through the heart. How does everybody feel about that? It's like, I hated that part of EMT school, right? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, Kendrick's like, I got that. Cool part. All right, so. Now we receive blood from the inferior superior, uh, the inferior and the superior vena cava. What's that other spot of the heart that I told you we receive blood from? Coronary, coronary sinus. So that is the part after the coronary vasculature has sent blood to the myocardium, oxygenated blood, and then the myocardium uses it and it returns it back through coronary veins to the coronary sinus, and it dumps back in here as well. Okay, and we'll look at a posterior view of the vasculature here in a minute. But we receive blood there, and then you what before you buy? Try. You try before you buy. So the tricuspid valve, so we receive blood from the right atrium through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. 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 All right. <laughs> <laughs> then we go in through, we have the pulmonary semilunar valve. Why is it called a semilunar valve? Because it looks like a half moon, right? It just, that's, that's the only reason, it's the appearance. So you have the pulmonary semilunar valve, which works off of pressure. It's a one-way valve, or at least it's supposed to be. So if you have valvular regurgitation, or like Dr. Kempler was saying, what if you have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and the fluid backs up? So the lung, this goes to the lungs, right? But what if the lungs are so obstructed that fluid is backing up here and your right ventricle is having to pump against a greater pressure? What's that called again? Hypertrophy. Hypertrophy, but what's the disease? Core pulmonal, right? Pulmonal meaning pulmonary, heart meaning core. Core. Okay, or yeah, thank you. You guys are tracking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did that on purpose. No. Um, it was a complete mistake. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think all four of them, if I'm not mistaken. We'll have to look it up. I'm not positive on that, so if you're looking it up right now, awesome. If not, remind me later and we'll take a look at it. All right. So if you have right sided heart failure, right ventricular failure, that is caused by increased pressure in the pulmonary circuit, that is core pulmonal. Okay? So as we know, inherently, the right ventricle is supposed to be a little thinner than the left ventricle. So we'll get into that in a minute. But the love, the love, the blood, <laughs> the blood will leave the right ventricle, go through the pulmonary semilunar valve into the pulmonary arteries. Now, what's the difference between an artery and a, and a vein? Good. An artery goes away from the heart and veins return to the heart. It has nothing to do with oxygenation. So the pulmonary arteries will send blood from the right ventricle to the lungs, right? So it's an artery, it's leaving the heart, it's going to the pulmonary. It gets oxygenated down at the capillaries and then comes back through the pulmonary veins because it's returning to the heart, right? So now we have the pulmonary veins here, which will push blood. So this is all oxygenated. It's a vein, or they are veins, but they're oxygenated. And the only thing that I don't like, this is a great picture, and I draw it all the time. But the difference is what you're not seeing, you have your pulmonary, you have your pulmonary trunk right here, but what's it hiding? What do you not see in this picture? The aorta is right here, but what you don't see, you don't see the pulmonary. 
<laughs> he says shush. She says shush. So if we were to move this out of the way, potentially we could see the pulmonary veins on the other side. Okay? Does that make sense? And that's one problem with these two dimensional drawings is that you're forgetting about the stuff that's behind here. You're, you're forgetting about, well, what if I move this guy out of the way? What's it look like? So I'm trying to get th this slide show you have multiple views of the heart. But just remember, you have pulmonary veins on this side, and you also have them on that side as well. So you have oxygenated blood coming back from both lungs, entering into here, and then you have your bicuspid valve, right? Because you try before you buy, the blood will fill during diastole passively, and then atrial kick will push a little more down in there to where it expands and then contracts and sends it through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta. Now, what does the aorta also do? It Dense expands elastic. and then contracts, right? Cool. Good, because it's elastic. It has elastic tissue that allows the expansion and the cr contraction. But it is possible. They can use it. I, I thought it was possible for all four. I just didn't, because it's, like I said, the pig tissue is so close to what we have on, on several different types of tissues. Primarily the connective tissues and the smooth and cardiac muscle. All right. How do they get the pig valves connected to the heart? The sutures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So the atria are also <laughs> the atria are separated by just like you have you you have an interventricular septum. A wall. What? A wall. Yes, there is a wall. There's a wall. There's an atrial wall right here. <laughs> <laughs> this wall is a good wall, it's a great wall. <laughs> the, ventricle, <laughs> the ventricle south of the atrium will pay for all of the wall. <laughs> oh, and if they don't think they're going to pay for it, they're going to pay for it. It's going to be a beautiful wall. And little babies, there's holes in this wall that don't open, that don't close sometimes. Those aren't good walls, but this is going to be a great wall. <laughs> huge, huge, huge wall. <laughs> you might see the SNL skit last week where they, they did like, they put up one panel of the wall and it was panels turned sideways. The guy turned and he's like, all right, boss. Yeah, I think we built a ladder though. <laughs> all right, so we have an interatrial septum. So septum, think about... Think about your nose right here. No, no not your tongue. <laughs> Carson said, think about, if you think about your septum, Carson goes. <laughs> this is great. I'm sure this is good. All right, so interatrial septum, we have an interventricular septum. These are supposed to primarily keep deoxygenated blood from mixing with oxygenated blood. All right? And the one thing that you're not seeing on here, what was that appendage? Dr. Kimper talked about it. I talked about it the other day. The left atrial, 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 atrial. left atrial appendage. Very good. Bless you. And that is, it, it's over here, and this, again, this drawing doesn't have a good representation of it, but seldomly you will have blood during atrial fibrillation. If the atria are just quivering and they're not actually doing their job on an organized fashion, you will have blood that fills up over here in this little appendage. And like he said, it looks like a little, a little pig ear. It looks like a little flap. So if blood's coagulating in there, it's just catch, it's just coagulating and coagulating and coagulating. It never gets put into circulation until potentially the patient takes a cardi or a uh, cardizem or a calcium channel blocker to where it re reintroduces the atrial kick and then the atria put that clot into circulation and you have whatever type of was that? A bigger problem. Oh, I thought you said a bigger perm. And I'm like, <laughs> yes. you are very artistic. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I'm saying that like somebody from Boston. <laughs> You're artistic. <laughs> um, so, don't throw anything at me. <laughs> Jamie's just grinning. He's like, you don't know, kid. That's yeah. for you to know. <laughs> the more you learn. All right, so this gets launched into circulation. 
the, the, the possible clot from the left atrial appendage, it could end up as an, as an MI, it could end up as, a, as any type of CVA, it could end up as an arterial occlusion anywhere, all right? So that's not a good wall, that's a bad wall. <laughs> All right, so we, we've talked about the valves, and, and what you'll see here, this is this looks weird, but it's just one ventricle. This is the left ventricle. All right, so we're talking about the valves, the semilunar valves. Um, again, like you see here, they're made of endocardial and connective tissue. So the semilunar valves, they are what they sound like. They look like a half moon. So you have a pulmonary semilunar valve and an aortic semilunar valve. So this is like if we took the heart, turned it up, and then whoosh, somebody cut it in half right where the valves were. Did you guys get to do it? Do it. Do what I just did. Um, so, and whenever we did the heart dissection lab, did you guys do, did you do a cross section like that where you could see the valves? You blew them apart. You blew them apart. On the mic. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> you had fun, that's all that matters. As long as nobody ate anything. <laughs> so, you have a tricuspid valve right here. So, the tricuspid valve is technically the only one that does not look like a semi lunar valve. So, just remember you try before you buy. Okay? Also, one little hint how many lobes, which you guys are past this, you should be able to tell me which one's the tricuspid, which one's the bicuspid. But how many lobes do you have on your right lung? Three. 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 How many do you have on your left lung? Three. Good. <clears throat> All right. Cool. So this is this is a representation of the mitral valve being open and then being or being open and then being closed. So remember, the opening is typically a passive process, but the papillary muscles will contract and pull the mitral valve open so that the blood can fill passively. And then upon contraction up here, they close preventing any type of backflow of blood, okay? Right. Again, like I said, the papillary muscles, these are what connect the valve itself to the actual myocardium. Now, the, the connection, the small connection tissues are called the chordae tendinae. They should be on the next one. There it is. So specialized fibers called the chordae tendinae will connect the valves to the papillary muscles. So that's what these little fibers are right here. Right here, right here, right here. So they're all they're, they're cords of tendons. So whenever those papillary muscles contract a little bit, it pulls the valves open so that the ventricles can fill passively. Okay. Okay. Now, let's see. We're good there. All right, so this is a cross section of a human heart. So, just like this picture is showing, if we're looking at semilunar valves versus tricuspid valves, so your this tricuspid valve looks like it's a little blown apart, but it truly it'll go over to the left a little bit here. Um, but you have you have semilunar valves that look they look like a half moon. So, moving on from there. All right, so we know that the superior vena cava, it is the, the uppermost or the superior most portion of the atria that receives blood. So truthfully, it's kind of a, it's, it's, a, it's an extension of the atria that will connect to the largest superior blood vessel. All of your, you have uh, external jugular veins, you have all types of larger subclavians, uh, you have external jugulars, you have internal jugular veins that will all return blood to this site. It receives all the blood from the upper portion of the body. This, the inferior vena cava, will receive all the blood from the lower portion of the body in the mesentery. that. Talked about that. We've talked about a lot of this blood flow. <clears throat> All right. 
So this gets into the actual physiology of the contraction a little bit, but we know that the intracardiac pressures are higher on the left side. So when we're talking about intracardiac, we're talking about the pressures within the chambers. So why would the pressure be higher in the left ventricle than it would be in the right ventricle? Good. Absolutely. It has to, it has to overcome afterload, which is peripheral vascular resistance. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Don't get confused. Just telling you what's coming. So if the pressure is higher in this left ventricle, it's because it has to pump against a higher pressure. It has to pump against afterload. <clears throat> And that's why, again, just like any muscle, if you're working out, muscles grow. So this one, the left side, has to pump against the higher pressure, so it will naturally be a little thicker. Before we move on to the vessels, there's one thing that I did not put in here that I want to, I need to go back and put in. I want you guys to write down in your notes over cardiology. What? Hey, they were hey, out loud. <laughs> oh, okay. So you have atrial naturetic peptide. So N A T I U R E T I C peptide. About to tell you. <laughs> and then you have B N P, which is brain naturetic peptide. Okay. Both of these are in your book. They are in uh, chapter three. They talk about these two peptides. Atrial natriuretic peptide is if you were to have any type of overexertion of the atria. So if for whatever reason you had an extreme backflow of blood that stretched the atria past where they're supposed to be, this is a substance that they will release. So it's not the actual death of myocardium that releases, that is, so hold on. Death of myocardium releases troponin, right? You guys remember the troponin head that gets put into circulation. It's not the death of it, it's just the overstretch of it. Similarly, Brain natriuretic peptide gets released when your ventricles stretch too much. So these are two markers that physicians will utilize, specifically cardiologists. They will utilize this plus other lab value findings plus your EKGs to determine heart failure. So that's if they find this floating around in your blood at all, that's when they're going to start ordering a lot. They'll, they'll order echocardiograms to look at the valves to make sure you don't have any kind of valvular disruption causing extra blood to flow in there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they will make sure that your ventricles aren't stretching too much because, or if they are having to stretch too, or if they're having to contract too hard because of the thickening of the ventricle. So these don't have a, a lab value or anything? They're just, if they're in the blood, then that's what? Correct, yeah. Okay. There, there is, um, to mine, and I, I do not know the numbers off the top of my head, um, and I don't, honestly, I, I've never memorized these, but the mm -hmm. presence of them in the bloodstream is going to initiate a whole different workup. So you'll actually get a cardiac work. If you come in for difficulty in breathing or dyspnea upon exertion, what does that mean? What is dyspnea Trouble on exertion? when you're doing something. Right. You're, you're, you're walking, you're cutting grass, something like that, and you have difficulty in breathing. So if you have that, you come in. They pull your blood gases and you have an increased amount of BMP and AMP, they're gonna do a whole cardiac workup on you at that point. So they may put you in the stress lab, they may just put you in EOU, which is emergency emergency, emergency observation unit. So just know that that's what these are. So if you see that, if you have a patient that comes into the ER on clinical and you're looking at lab values and you see an increased, it, it'll say, the, the lab values during clinical kind of cheat a little bit because they'll ha either have an H or an L telling you high or low. But if you see an H beside this, then you should all automatically be thinking like, hmm, this may be a heart failure patient. Or they may have gone into heart failure for whatever reason. <clears throat> BMP also contributes to the I believe, yes. I think, it, I think it does say that in the book. Yes. Yeah, there was something in the book about it. 
Yeah, I, I don't want to say definitively, but I'm pretty sure that sounds right. All right, so as we are talking, we're moving on, and we'll talk about the vessels. So you have you have the aorta, which has three primary parts. You have the ascending aorta, goes up, out of the heart, right? And then you have the thoracic aorta after that. So technically you have ascending and then you have descending, but the ascending is on its own, it goes up. And then everything after that is the thoracic aorta. Now the diaphragm serves as a division between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity, right? So any portion of the aorta past the diaphragm is abdominal aorta. So you have three primary, you have the ascending, the thoracic, and the abdominal. Now, if you wanted to split hairs and get really specific, you could say that the ascending comes up here, then you start to have the descending, which is also the thoracic, all right? Then the thoracic goes through the diaphragm and becomes the abdominal aorta. Does everybody feel okay with that? And then you have major arteries that branch off of there. All right, so coronary circulation, the reason that this is here is because, again, where do the coronary arteries branch off of? They branch off of the base of the aorta. That's also something that you don't get to see in all these cool, these illustrations of the heart throughout the slideshow unless it's focused on the coronary vasculature. Because typically the, you, you have the, the, the aortas, no, not the aorta, the atria that are in the way of it. So they, they originate at the base of the aorta and they become perfused upon diastole. So systole occurs, which causes blood to be ejected into the aorta, the aorta stretches, and then upon that aortic rebound, blood gets shot down into the coronary vasculature. All right? So as we know, we, we, have they, we have the main coronary arteries that lie on the surface of the heart, and then we have smaller tributaries or smaller branches of those that we call arterioles that penetrate down into the muscle. Now what's cool about this, we have, we, have a, we have a property, and this is something that I don't really understand that well, but it really fascinates me. I, and I say this every time I teach it, and I tell myself mentally, go look it up and learn more about it, but I never do. Um, anastomosis, or angio, the, 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 the ability for you, your coronary blood vessels to grow and grow around a, a clot, which is also called angiogenesis. So our, our heart has the ability to say, hey, I'm not being perfused. I need the vessels that are perfusing me to grow around whatever's blocking. Does that make sense? So that's, I mean, that's really cool. I have no idea how it works or why it works. But that is, it is a really neat property to where we can adapt a little bit. Now there is an extreme. If you have a 100% occlusion, then everything south of that occlusion is not being perfused. So there's a, there's a great difference between that. So here we go. So now the atria, the, the tops of the atria have been lifted up out of the, out of, to make sure that we can actually view the coronary vasculature, all right? So you have the left coronary artery, which is here, also known as the left main, all right? Once it bifurcates, now it has two different names. But the left coronary artery or the left main coronary artery is this little section right here. And when you guys go into the cath lab, you will be able to see whenever they're sitting. Has anybody seen a cath before? Or at least seen the dye, seen everything that's happening? After this, you'll be able to go in, and I, I promise you, you'll, you'll be able to sit there and be like, oh, holy crap. I can tell, even though the blockage is here, I can tell that they're going into the left main because you'll know your anatomy well enough to say that, all right, I see whenever they inject the dye, I see this little L shape, which is the right coronary artery, and then this is stopped right here. So I, you can, you'll you sit there and say, oh man, that's a, uh, that's a left anterior occlusion. And they're gonna look at you and be like, hmm, must be a pyramid student. Um, 
But here at the base of the aorta, you have the left main coronary artery. So as it bifurcates here, you have the left anterior descending or the LAD. That perfuses so much of contractile myocardium, it's not even funny, specifically the left ventricle. If, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the one that goes down the septal portion of the heart is the left anterior descending. The one that circles around the side is the circumflex, the left circumflex or the left circumferential artery. However you want to say it, that's fine. So you have the left circumflex that circles around the back, and that's what this guy is right here. This is technically the posterior side of the heart. So the heart's kind of see-through right now. Does that make sense? So you have the left main, which bifurcates into the left anterior descending, as well as the left circumflex. So it circles around the back of the heart. Everybody okay with that? And we're going to talk about the circumflex artery here again in a second. And this is a question I need to ask Jason because they gather data about this stuff all the time. But we'll talk about the right coronary artery for a moment. So you have the right coronary artery, which in your mind should make an L. So, or, eh, it's kind of, a, kind of a backwards L. But in your mind, this should make an L. So you have the right coronary artery, which bifurcates here into the marginal artery and the posterior descending. So the posterior descending keeps going and it goes around the back side of the heart. Now, the part that I was telling you that I want you to remember the, the left circumflex is because if you have an inferior STEMI, which is typically the right coronary artery, then that could mean that you have a blockage here. Well, depending on the patient population, Sometimes the left circumflex is the one that perfuses the posterior side of the heart. In some patients, the, the PDA comes off of the right coronary artery. So if you were to block it here, then the posterior side of the heart gets blocked off as well. So, and that's, I don't want you to, that's one problem with, with a situation like this. This is statistically speaking, this is the majority of the population. The majority of the population, their vasculature looks like this. But it's almost, from the last time I talked to Jason, which about this topic in particular was 2016, he was saying that it's close to 50-50. About 50% 50 of the population receive the posterior supply of blood from the left circumflex, and the other receive it from the posterior branch of the right coronary. So that's, that's kind of scary, right? Because if you block off if you get an occlusion right here on your right coronary, not only does your AV node stop receiving blood, but everything on the posterior side of the heart stops receiving blood as well. So that's, it's, it's really important to be able to diagnose on a 12 lead, and that's where potential uh, reciprocating changes may come into play. So if you have elevation 2-3 AVF on the inferior leads, then you know, all right, that's a right coronary artery, that's an inferior STEMI, I don't want to dump the preload, and then you have depression potentially in one and AVL. Then that could mean that the posterior side is infarcting as well. So you can do a posterior check of your EKG leads. And if you have elevation on the posterior side, then you can be like, yep, it's a right coronary artery occlusion with posterior involvement. And, and you'll be able to diagnose that from the truck. Now, I've never seen anyone do a posterior EKG mm -hmm. in the field. Is that common or is that, should it's it be more common than it is? A lot, especially for you guys, you don't have time to do it. Yeah. Because you you have a quick transport time. And Barrow, where, where do you guys take your stimmies? What's up? Yeah, usually Athens or something okay. uh, so how long of a transport could you guys have? Oh, really? So you may have time to do it. Whereas you guys, you're not gonna be able to, you know, have enough time to do it. If you have, if it looks, if it quacks like a duck, sounds like a duck and smells like a duck, it may be a dog, but it's probably a duck. But you are, if you have elevation in two, three and ABF, if you have elevation in two, three and ABF, the patient's pale, cool, diaphoretic, borderline hypotension, that's enough. 
you you can confirm a STEMI off of that because all you need is is you need five they've actually reduced it but you have to have elevation and two or more contiguous leads and we'll learn what that means when we get into 12 lead but if you if you do a posterior that's just extra you don't have to do it or you can do a v4r which is also another confirmation device but your primary thing you found two three and abf and the patient is symptomatic you can activate a STEMI alert from there. So what does Athens do? Is it St. Mary's or Athens that does a lot of good STEMI work? Oh, do they? So do they let you bypass the ER to go to the cath lab? Awesome. Um, are you doing Berlinta or Plavix? Berlinta? Very good. Very, very good. If it's the right exterior that you would do the V4R, then at that point you would not do the nice Correct. Correct. And according to Jason, Jason wants us to stay away from nitro and STEMIs in general. Is that because it preload? Absolutely. It'll drop that preload, like Brian was saying, that V4R is just a super confirming saying that, yes, this is definitely the right coronary artery that's being occluded. So if we were to, if, if we were to vasodilate the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, what happens to the blood here in the right atrium? It decreases, right? Because if we, if we vasodilate here, blood pressure drops, so the right, right, right ventricle is not getting blood, so it's not getting shot into the pulmonary circuit, so it's not getting shot into the left ventricle either. So you're dropping your preload in the system, or you're dropping your blood pressure in the system, which reduces the blood throughout the heart, Therefore, nothing's getting shot up the aorta. I mean, you, you still have some, but it's not gonna be efficient anymore. So if you drop the blood here, it affects the amount of blood you have inside here to get sent up to the aorta to get sent down into here. So you can make your patient even worse. Does that make sense? Why do they send nitro home with patients? I don't know. We ran a guy who was having an inferior who took two nitro at the same time before we got there. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No, he, he lived. But his was he super was like, bottomed out? Yeah, he was like 80s. And he was, he was pretty you see, out. and then that creates a problem because now we're learning about heart failure and we're saying, oh crap, well you took two nitros even though you shouldn't have. Now your blood pressure is 80. Do you want to flood this heart full of fluid? Mm -hmm. But you got to get their pressure back up somehow, right? So that's, again, that's why Jason and the folks in Northeast Georgia just want us to take nitro out of STEMI protocol completely. Because if you dump the preload, it's not just RCAs that may be, or inferior STEMIs that could be affected, it could be all of them, because every patient's different. So if you drop the preload, the myocardium's not being perfused because the blood in the whole system drops, right atrium, pulmonary circuit to the left ventricle, you don't have an, as much blood here because you dropped it over here. So now when the left ventricle contracts, you don't have near as much blood going to any of the vasculature. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're kind of, they want to keep it in for heart failure patients for CPAP use, like the Foman protocol, furosemide, oxygen, albuterol, morphine, nitro. So they, they want to keep it in for that. However, for this, they want to take it out. Does that make sense? So are you saying, like he's saying, that if you have a left main uh, MI, then your circumflex is what's perfused in the back of the heart instead of whatever the other one was? The, the, the posterior one. descending. Yeah. Right. Instead of <laughs> instead of that, then, uh, oh, my bad. Sorry. <laughs> that could jack up their preload, too. Absolutely. So, so on, on average, how many um, services have that anti-coagulant protocol? So anybody in Region 2 does. Barrow County is the furthest Region 2, right, in your direction? You're 10? How about you guys are Region 2? Well, we're dealing with that BS that Dr. O'Neill trying to drop, trying to use our license for drones. Mm. So, uh, region 10. Wow, I didn't know that. Now, I guess that Athens Regional thing is new about using Berlinta, because at Bates County, we try to take a STEMI down to Athens. So we have Berlinta, and they, they denied it and said that I don't think they, that we can give us Plavix because we quit carrying Plavix. They, they're real specific. We have they no get spicy protocol. They send our protocol to Berlinta, but they always get spicy when they're off the Berlinta. And see, ours had Berlinta in the protocol, but we were calling ahead, letting them know, hey, and they told us no. And then we, always got, we had to go directly to the ER 
We sat there for probably about 10 or 15 minutes. Are you course. serious? The ER doctor got down there, checked it out, then got the cardiologist down there. Wow. And, the lady, and she got in a um, 300% LAD blockage. What's the time of nothing? Right. So, and that kind of screws you guys over because you did used to be Region 2, right? Weren't, weren't you guys Region 2 at some point? I'm not sure. I haven't been there long enough to know who Rivers is. Rivers, do you know? I, I'm almost positive you guys used to be. And maybe you've always been Region 10, but you, they. Barrow has always been involved with Region 2 stuff. Like yeah, you've always been. It's you got had, very aggressive protocols in favor of the rest of the Right, yeah. And you guys have always been involved with the STEMI Summit. You've always been involved with regional trauma meetings and things like that. So maybe you're just like, in a, a, like a stepbrother or something. I think the has know. the same thing too, don't they? Because they're Region 10. So right. They operate a lot in Region 2. Yeah. So, and, and, but Jackson has very aggressive protocols as well. So. So, but what you're saying now is that they will let you skip the cath lab now, or skip to the cath lab now. <laughs> okay. Skip it and bring it to the grave. Yeah, a lot of times we'll stop in at Barrow, I know it's kind of weird, but we'll stop in at Barrow and then they will refer us directly to the cath lab at Radisson. As opposed to taking into if we don't do that, we'd have to go over to Gainesville directly, but if we stop right at Barrow, the doc is there, we can go sit the cath lab at Radisson. Right. Yeah, because Brazelton has a good cath lab. I think they can take three or four patients at once, something like that. They're not as big as Gainesville's, but they do have the capability. And potentially, by the end of your program, we'll be doing cath lab rotations in Barrow. And they've been working on, they, they were missing, I think it was the ICU. They didn't have the room in the ICU to do a full operating cath lab. So right. They were working with the so no, you can't do some stuff there. But you've got to be referred there. Right. Yeah. They they have to know you're coming, and they have to have beds available. So that's uh, yeah, that's definitely good. So all right. So we have the right coronary artery and artery artery. I was about to make fun of Carson, so I said artery. Um, but the right coronary artery, which bifurcates into the which one, Carson? <laughs> Posterior and descending artery. Posterior and descending artery, good. Artie. <laughs> and also the right marginal artery. That's <laughs> extra R the fan I am. Not a week. Alright. Okay. So this is another yes, this is fat. This is cardiac fat. That's a legit thing. If you see a real human heart, you will have cardiac fat on top of this because you do have to insulate this stuff, right? So as it's showing here, remember how I was telling you about the, the fibrous pericardium or the parietal pericardium. It's the same thing. That's what this is. They have it pulled back. So this is just a drawing. Probably it looks like a colored version of the Gray's Anatomy because if you look up, not, not the crappy show, but the actual book, it has really amazing drawings of anatomy. And so that's, that's kind of what this looks like. But if you have, if you pull back the fibrous pericardium, this is what you see. All right. So left main artery is covered up here, the left main coronary artery, but here it bifurcates down into the LAD and then the left circumflex. And then coming up of here, you have the right coronary artery, right marginal, and then the posterior descending, which comes off of there. <clears throat> All right, so this is just another view of the same thing, but you also, here we go, so the right coronary artery, so this shows them connecting, because again, it just depends on the patient. Sometimes on the posterior side of the heart, the, the, the perfusion comes from the left circumflex, but sometimes it comes off of the posterior descending from the right coronary. So the posterior side of the heart is kind of a kind of a toss up, but so does that affect which one of uh, which uses the AV node in that case? No, the AV node always gets perfused by the right marginal, gotcha. or as this slide's calling it, the acute marginal. But the right marginal artery off of the right coronary. So, all right. So we're looking at the posterior side of the heart now. Primarily because I wanted you guys to see 
the coronary sinus. So it's a it's a big old fat vein. It's like the size of your pinky. But you have you have this large vein to where again all of the blood that's been used up by the myocardium gets returned back into circulation via an entrance here into the right atrium. Okay. So this is the inferior view of the heart. So we've taken the heart and we kind of turned it. So just look at the apex here. Inferior vena cava and then your left ventricles over here. So again, we took it and we turned it up like that. So this is primarily to show you where the pulmonary circuit enters into the left atrium. So the pulmonary veins come in pulmonary veins are coming in over here as well so like I was showing you earlier typically on that anterior view you only see the left side of the pulmonary veins coming back from the lungs if you flip the heart you can actually see the pulmonary veins coming back in on both sides all right and also um, I do want you guys to know the vasculature coming off of the the aorta so if you have the, the brachiocephalic artery here, and hold on, let me go back. Where is it? Yeah. So the left subclavian, subclavian comes out and it goes to, it, sound, it is what it sounds like. It's under your clavicle. So it comes up and branches out this way. Then you have your left common carotid, which is one of the primary blood supplies to your brain. The only difference on the right side is that we have the brachiocephalic first. So the, the difference is the brachiocephalic will, will come out to the right and then it bifurcates. It turns into the right subclavian and then it turns into the right carotid. So that is, that is where your right carotid circulation comes from. Again, this brachiocephalic artery here on the front of the ascending aorta will turn into the right subclavian as well as the right common carotid. Make sense? <clears throat> Is that brachiocephalic generally larger than the other two? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So it still has, you know, the blood flow separate. Yes. All right, so like we were saying, the coronary arteries receive blood flow during diastole. So we have the openings at the base of the aorta, also called ostia, which will open. They, they open because of the pressure caused by that atrial stretch or the aortic stretch. The aortic stretch occurs because of the elastic property, and then as it contracts, it pushes the blood past those ostia and then it perfuses the myocardium, or at least it's supposed to. So in theory, the left anterior descending artery will supply the anterior wall of the left ventricle. Why is that so important? What does the left ventricle supply? Anything, right? Yeah, it supplies the, the brain, your kidneys, anything that's important or considered vital gets, gets supplied by the left ventricle. Is that is that artery the left? Uh, descending artery is that the widow maker yes that is whenever people say that a widow maker has occurred it's typically a higher occlusion of the left anterior descending now let's say you only have maybe a 30 percent occlusion and that's where I was talking about collateral circulation or angiogenesis so let's say that only 30 percent of this thing is occluded here and where does the plaque build up is it actually build up in the middle Good, inside the tunica, right? So the, if the plaque's building up there, it's only 30%. So it's almost like on, on 285, if traffic completely gets blocked, what happens to the rest of the highway? It's jammed, right? You have hundreds of, if not a thousand people trying to go in one direction, but now they're blocked. But if only one lane shuts down, that impedes flow. Does that make sense? So that's what we're talking about here. You have impeded flow, but your myocardium are sensitive enough to it to where somehow we start generating blood vessels to go around it. 
So it's like you've opened up a detour back road. It's still, it's not effective, it's a back road, but it gets you around that occlusion. Can you tell like how high up it is like the pinning is for, so you have an anterolateral pinning mm -hmm. that would be a higher one because it's involving more? Yep, and that's what the one and ABL are. You have your high laterals and then your low laterals are on your precordial leads, which are V5 and V6. So you can tell how high it is one and ABL are up here, V5 and V6 are down here. Yeah. So whichever one's elevated are the ones that you'll be able to see. At what point do they put like a stent in? Like what percentage of that? I don't know, to be honest. I, I don't know if, if at 50%, because at, at a certain point, diet and exercise aren't gonna change it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the cutoff is. That's a good question for Jason. So. Um, Text him right now. FaceTime. FaceTime with Jason. <laughs> hey, bro, can we FaceTime? <laughs> He's going to ask right now. What do you want? At what percentage of occlusion? you decide <laughs> what what about those tenants that have like six heart attacks they should be pretty big yeah there you go we will make a day oh that was quick 70% really? yep hmm. 70% of <laughs> Ask him what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What are you wearing? It's gross. I never leave. <laughs> All right. So the left. The left coronary and circumflex, or yeah, the, the, circum, the circumflex artery will perfuse approximately 45% of the AV node. So that's, that, or the, excuse me, the SA node. So that's a big deal, right? If, that, if the SA node is our primary pacemaker, then this, this portion and the tributaries off of it are very important for that perfusion. Only about 10% of the AV node though. However, on the right coronary artery, the right coronary will supply a lot more of the AV. At what point do you go from your SA node to your AV node? As far as when do the pacemaker takes over? Right. Uh, just whenever that, as soon as the rate, typically, if, if whenever your P wave is gone, your AV node is, has taken over. So you could, you could have a sinus bradycardia. So it's not based upon rate. If you have a rate of, of 50, but you still have a P wave, your SA node is still intact. It's just not, it's not functioning. It's not firing at the right rate. Okay, so um, if you have blockage between the AV node and you don't have blockage between the SA node, you know, the book or whatever was making it sound like the next in line, so the one with his would take up rate, but that doesn't make any sense because they're still in SA mode. So the SA node's firing, but it's not able to, it's not able to effectively communicate. Okay. So it's just interconnected because it's level. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. So an EKG reads voltage and time. So if you have elevation, the elevation is because of a prolonged amount of time to get around something. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Don't we have to start depression? So depression is it's technically the through the movement. other side. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, and we'll talk about that today, hopefully, is Eindhoven's triangle and the augmented leads. As, as electricity goes towards a lead, you have positive. As it goes away from a lead, you have negative. So we'll, we'll talk about that as we keep going. Um, all right. All right.
right, so as far as the arterial system, um, again, the, the, the carotid arteries are the main primary suppliers of circulation to your brain. But as it shows here, the brachiocephalic will bifurcate into the right common carotid, carotid <laughs> artery, the right common carotid, carotid <laughs> and the right subclavian. I'm tired. <laughs> Very tired. All right. So, um, also, you still have your brachial arteries that come down, and then the antecubital area here, you have, you, you have arteries down through there as well. Also, you will also see access obtained in the cath lab via femoral, femoral artery access. Can y'all just do a stroke assessment on me real quick? <laughs> just real fast. All right. So you can have radial artery access in the cath lab, and you can also have femoral artery access in the cath lab. But just know that your femoral arteries actually are a lot further down than you would think. A lot of people, when we check for a pulse on the femoral area, you're technically checking around the external iliac arteries. So, or the common, you have the common iliac arteries that branch <laughs> off of here. So technically, this is where we're palpating for a pulse, but we call it a femoral. So they will gain access in the cath lab here, but why would, why would gaining access on the radial artery be more advantageous than on the femoral artery? Good, absolutely. So it's, it's, less, it's less of network to have to go through. And also, what about clotting? Do you think it's going to be harder to clot this thing off after you're finished, or this one? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. So the layers of the arteries, like we've already learned, we've talked about. We have capillaries, which are strictly adventitia, or excuse me. <laughs> intima. Tunica intima is a capillary. <laughs> Carson, you're killing me. All right. Your capillary has the ability to what? Permeate, right? These discs have the ability to separate and let fluid and other proteins and substances in and out. Now, all the tunica intima, the innermost layer, all it is, is a capillary. <laughs> Carson, you're killing me. You got to get out of here. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> All right. So, the tunica media, think muscle. Again, just like the myocardium is the middle layer, the, the tunica media is the smooth muscle of the vein or the artery. That is going to be the, the layer of the, of the blood vessel that will either contract or relax. And then the tunica adventitia, that is the outer, outermost layer of the blood vessel. All right, so adventitia on the outermost, the tunica media on the innermost, and then the tunica intima on, on the innermost. So the middle is you have connective tissue and you have muscle on arteries. Why would you have connective tissue and muscle on arteries? Squeeze. So, so you you can constrict all you can constrict both of them because you have smooth muscle, but that elastic the rebound property. So the rebound or the the ability to rebound is what the connective or the elastic membrane gives you on the artery side of things. That's going to be the primary difference between the two. Arteries, larger <laughs> arteries like the aorta, have the ability to rebound and pop back together. Whereas the veins, they, they can constrict and they can relax, but that's primarily the difference. You have the rebound elasticity in this, in the arteries, all right? So I don't remember what slide number this is, but 50. 50, so that tells the difference between the two of them. All right, so just to kind of get a picture home, so you have the aorta, which is the largest artery, and then it branches down to arteries, arterioles, and capillaries. Capillaries are where the venous system meets the arterial system. So whenever we're talking about veins, we have 
venules that turn into veins that will dump into the vena cava. This all needs to be on this thing. All of this <laughs> needs to be, this needs to be really big and that needs to be really small. <laughs> I need to fix that. <laughs> Yeah. Y'all take a five minute break. <laughs> We're about to. All right. So, one of the biggest things to remember about the venous system is that it's a low pressure system. Again, the arterial system is high pressure because whenever we have a higher pressure and we have that elastic stretch, we have the rebound that will help us eject blood even further. Something else that will help us return blood to the heart and send blood to the extremities is smooth or is a skeletal muscle contraction. So walking around, moving, exercising, just standing up and walking and moving your arms will contract skeletal muscle and it will send blood throughout the system. It will either return it to the heart or it will send it to the system. Okay. Three forty-five. We're rotating it four. <laughs> trying to think about. We talked about that. Okay. So we'll talk about this before we before we take a break. Actually, no, we won't. This will be a good place to pick up tomorrow with everybody. So y'all take a take a ten minute break before you go over yeah. into the Sim Center. <laughs> You're still wrong. I said ten. All right. So hey, who in here needs? I think everybody that needed to be checked off was in the first. Yes, sir. Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay. So.